agendas. First, welcome to this first program in our Postering Sharon series. Before I get to introductions, just a little housekeeping, please mute yourself during the presentation. And if you have a question that comes to mind while Leonard is speaking and you don't wanna forget it, you could just type it into the chat box. Um, otherwise, you'll be, have an opportunity to ask the question directly um, during the Q&A session after his presentation. Leonard, as I said, has some great images to share. So you might wanna turn on speaker view so that you can see them prominently on your screen. And uh, the main reason we are here this evening is that we moved out of the library after 127 years. Um, and um, when we did that, uh, July a year ago, the movers came and we had to empty out the entire building at 10 Upper Main Street um, to prepare for our restoration and expansion project. And we had a very large oak table upstairs in the Connecticut room. So if you're familiar with the library, you go up the big stairs in the front the, and you get to the landing, the building on the left, the building on the northwest side upstairs with the beautiful windows, um, lots of light coming in. There's a big old oak table up there where we would have board meetings and other committee meetings and people would use it during the day for reading and studying. Well, the poor movers, they had to figure out how to get that table out of the library. And for some reason, they decided they were not going to carry it down the front staircase. I don't know why I didn't ask them. Um, and, but we have a mezzanine with a gallery um, above the main area of the library downstairs. And they decided the best thing to do would be to lower this giant table over the railing to some guys who were standing down below. They had two guys standing on our old circulation desk, which was close to the railing. And then they had a couple more guys on the floor. I didn't actually see this. I came in a little bit after, but apparently there were two guys on the floor, um, you know, standing on the floor and these big guys up above started to lower the table down to the guys on the desk who were gonna hand it to the guys on the floor and this giant drawer slid open and some papers came out and um, nobody had known they were in there. There were no handles on the drawers. It didn't look like the table had drawers and in it they found when we later counted there were 101 posters of all different sizes. Some of them were folded, some were flat and opened up, some were curled up on the edges, some had tape on them, you know, left and browned and brittle. Others had tears, some had little pieces missing out of them. There were all kinds of things. Um, some of them had the address of the library stamped on the back that were folded up. They'd obviously really never been opened up or used. Um, you could see which ones had been used and which ones had never seen the light of day. There was, um, you know, there were a wide variety of things. There was a Connecticut state proclamation from 1919 announcing a statewide day of prayer and fasting. There was um, a really fabulous locally printed poster printed in Millerton that announced the festivities on the town green in Sharon um, on July 4th, 1918, just a few months before Armistice Day. There were US government printed posters from both world wars. And of course, of interest tonight, there were 10 posters that had been saved from Children's Book Week from the 50s into the early 1960s. We realized right away that we had an amazing treasure and we applied for and received an ARPA Humanities Grant, which was funded um, through ARPA money that went to the American Library Association and the National Endowment for the Humanities. They made this money available to 200 libraries um, earlier this year for programs that promoted humanities in libraries. So we've used that money to preserve, restore, and share the collection. And I wanna thank those organizations for making this program possible tonight. We've begun digitizing the posters and we have used grant funds to professionally restore um, eight of the most significant examples in the collection. And those eight pieces have been framed. And I'm happy to announce that they'll be exhibited at the gallery uh, at the Sharon Historical Society from October 16th to December 22nd, give you a chance to see them before they are moved back to their permanent home in our beautifully restored library sometime, um, hopefully fairly early next year. I'm so pleased to have Leonard Marcus with us tonight. Leonard is one of the world's preeminent authorities on children's books and the people who create them. As his website states, he is an historian, an author, a critic, and a curator. He curated the landmark exhibit, the ABC of it, Why Children's Book Matter, Books Matter at the New York Public Library, which was viewed 
in 2013 and 2014 by a record setting 540,000 visitors. Maybe some of you had the chance to see that amazing exhibit. He is the author or editor of about 25 books and he has attended our annual book signing, I think twice maybe at least, yeah. um, to present those books and sign some of those books. So we're so happy to welcome you here tonight, Leonard, so that we can learn more about the history of Children's Book Week and our wonderful posters. Okay. Well, thank you, Gretchen and Caitlin, for organizing this event. Um, and I, it's such a great story. Um, you know, I usually think of you know libraries as places where everything is cat everything is cataloged and put in its place. And to find out that there's a hidden treasure in a library seems almost magical to me. Um, Children's Book Week was the world's first um, celebration of um, literacy and children. Um, ever. And it started um, in 1919, uh, which you'll realize is the year just after the end of World War I. And the creation of Book Week was linked to the end of the war in a way that I'm going to explain in a minute. Um, the other thing about these posters, since it's a series that has now run for over 100 years, is that they represent a, um, a cross section, almost like rings in an old tree. Um, telling you about the history of graphic art in America and um, a lot about what was happening in society um, from one decade to another. And in the images I'm going to show you now, um, all of those sort of themes and um, discoveries that can be made from looking at the posters carefully um, will be um, illustrated. So now I'm just going to uh, share my screen and I'll be able to show you these things. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So um, this is one of the many uh, parades um, up Fifth Avenue in the months following the arm signing of the armistice. Um, and while this was going on, while one of these parades, I'm not sure it's this one in particular, uh, there was a meeting happening uh, in the 42nd Street Library, which you see off to the right. And a few people from publishing and the library world were getting together to hatch the plan uh, that became Children's Book Week. Now, um, the war, of course, was a really terrible event, uh, violent um, use of um, scientific method for killing on an unprecedented scale. And um, it led a lot of people to think about um, the children of society and what they could do to prevent um, something like that from ever happening again. Of course, it was called the world war to end all wars. And one way that that uh, sentiment was put into action was in um, big leaps forward in the way children's books were published and made available um, throughout the United States. Um, this poster, which you have uh, an example of at the library, this is one of the 101 posters that was um, discovered in that drawer, um, comes from this exact moment when people were starting to look beyond the war and to realize that it was time to have a children's year, a time to devote a lot of effort to making the lives of the next generation better. Um, and by then, a Andrew Carnegie had um, been building um, public libraries across America for, for quite a few years. Um, he, he constructed a total of over 1,600 libraries, not just in big cities, but also in relatively small uh, towns. Um, and he started in the 1880s and finished uh, in 1929. Um, and one of the features of most, if not all of these libraries, was that um, they had a dedicated children's reading room. Now, this was not an obvious thing to have decided on because um, in the middle of the 19th century on almost to the turn of the century, um, librarians debated about whether it was a good idea to let children into the libraries at all. Um, there were the obvious reasons, children are noisy, they have sticky fingers, but more than that, um, some people were concerned about what books children might get their hands on and how it might influence their 
morality. Um, and the best way to illustrate that point or sort of to remind you of how that could have been true is to, is to have you think of the music man, um, either the play or the movie, uh, some of which is set in a library um, in a typical American Midwestern town. And the parents are up in arms, uh, concerned that the librarian there is letting their children read Balzac, you know, which is the sort of code name for um, highly colored, um, suggestive uh, French literature. Um, part of the purpose of having dedicated children's rooms was to keep kids away from stuff like that. Um, but the other reason, of course, was to introduce children um, whether they could afford to buy books or not, uh, it was all free and all open to everyone, to introduce them to uh, the best of art and literature that was being created uh, at that time, and to uh, give them a first taste of culture and the better things of life. Um, so around 1900, um, the profession of children's librarian came into existence for the first time. And this was happening for the first time, not just in America, but in the world. Um, and many of the things that are part of the story, the innovations are um, things that I think we as Americans can be proud of for having innovated. Um, first children's rooms, the first children's librarians, the first um, holiday uh, for literacy, uh, which is what Children's Book Week really is. Um, so this is a typical uh, children's room. Storytelling was a big part of it. And standard setting for books was also very, very important because there, there were a lot of um, commercial publishers who were just out to make a buck by um, printing sensational uh, pulp fiction, essentially for children and teens in those days. And the librarians kind of uh, drew a line in the sand and said, we're not going to choose any old thing for the children's rooms. We're gonna be very selective. And not only that, the librarians in New York City, which was the, and still is the um, capital city of the media, uh, of Mer the American media uh, world, uh, decided that they would attempt to influence publishers and help them to realize what a good children's book could be like, set the standards for them. And that be uh, librarians became a very proactive force in children's literature in America um, around that time and on to the present day. So um, on the left here, the woman talking into the phone, sitting at her desk, is the very first um, editor of children's books in the world, um, also in New York, uh, Louise Seaman. And she was hired in 1919, the year after World War II ended, because the publishers realized that as the librarians had just gotten so organized, they had created a new market for children's books and publishers felt they had to take advantage of this great opportunity and to hire uh, specialists of their own who would speak the same language as these new children's librarians who had just come onto the scene. Um, and Louise Seaman had gone to Vassar. She had very good credentials. She had um, taught briefly um, in a private school in New Haven. So she had some connection to working with children. Um, and she uh, she applied for her job by writing uh, a piece of advertising copy in the form of a Shakespearean sonnet. So she sort of bowled over um, the management, all of whom were men, and all of whom assumed that uh, work publishing for children should be done by women. It was the stereotype of the of the age. Um, and she um, seized the opportunity and published really incredible books. Um, both at the high end, books that were almost like artist books that were quite expensive, but you know, beautiful and real treasure to have at home. And also inexpensive 50 cent books, um, which were um, almost affordable by most people, I would say, but uh, illustrated with colored pictures. And so she was trying to reach um, all across the country at every economic level. Um, and she, she was the editor at Macmillan, which at that time was headquartered in the building uh, on Lower Fifth Avenue, which later became the Forbes uh, magazine building and now belongs to NYU. 
Okay. So Louise Seaman was one of the people who got together at that meeting at the 42nd Street Library to talk about Book Week. And here are two of the other people who were at that meeting. On the left is Frederick Melcher, um, who is the least well-known pioneer of American children's books, I, I think, and really a heroic figure. Um, you know, by day, he was the editor of the trade magazine of the book industry, Publishers Weekly, but he was also a fierce advocate for children's books and for, and the way he would put it was that in a democracy, you need to have a literate um, younger generation who will, you know, grow up to take over and um, they have to be able to think clearly and have um, a good head on their shoulders. So he was constantly pressing the industry as a whole not to treat children's books as you know, second rung material, but as actually vital to the future of, uh, of a literate society. So it was Melcher who um, proposed that there be, uh, or was one of the people who proposed that there should be a holiday like Book Week. He also proposed the Newbery Medal, which was the world's first um, literary prize for children's books and was first given just a few years later, 1922. And several years after that, he came back again and said, we should have a prize for illustration. And he proposed um, the Caldecott Medal, not only proposed, but put up the money to support um, the effort. Uh, and he did everything he possibly could by making speeches and writing editorials and just being available uh, to help in any way he could to move the agenda of uh, children's book publishing forward um, in America. And to his right in, on this screen is a young woman uh, named Ann Carol Moore. And she became the most influential children's librarian in the world. Um, she came from Maine. Uh, her father was a lawyer and she wanted to read law with him. Um, but he suddenly died and she had to come up with a new plan. She came down to New York and studied librarianship at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, where they had an experimental children's library on the site uh, as a way of training young women uh, to be children's librarians, the first generation of children's librarians. That was one of the few places where you could learn how to do it. And they put her in charge of that, that uh, room. And she was very happy there until the Brooklyn Public Library, which was separate from New York Public, decided to start its own children's book division. And Ann Carol Moore, who was extremely ambitious and competitive, realized that you know this town isn't big enough for the both of us. And it was just then that the 42nd Street Library was, uh, was being constructed and the New York Public Library was really coming together as one of the world's great institutions. They recruited her, uh, she crossed the river um, and remained at New York Public for many, many years. Um, she was not happy just to be there she was publishing lists, annual lists of best books that went out to the entire country. Um, she became very involved in the awards committees. Um, she was setting standards for um, librarianship as a profession that had first national and then international um, ramifications. So she had her thumb in every pie. Um, and when talk of having a national celebration of literacy uh, came along, she was really the right person from the library world to become involved. Uh, the last person, uh, and actually he was the one who originated the idea to be at that meeting and to create Book Week in that small group was this man, Franklin Matthews, who was the official librarian of the Boy Scouts of America. And the Boy Scouts were founded in 1910. So they were really a pretty new organization. And they were reaching a large um, audience and were concerned about um, children's morality, their education. This was a time when only less than 20% of American children uh, made it past eighth grade. Um, so education and the future that a young person without much of an education was likely to have was a really urgent issue in the minds of all these people. So getting uh, families at home to, to uh, have books for their kids to read and just to, you know, to read to them at night and just encourage them to, to pay attention to um, 
all the opportunities that books could open up to them, it was not just a, a nice thing to be doing. It was seen as life-changing for millions of, of young people across the country. Um, so here are a few of the first Book Week posters. The idea of Book Week was to get communities involved. When Carnegie gave his money for those libraries, he, there, was, there was a hook, there was an, a stipulation, and it was that he would only give a town or a city a library if people there would guarantee that they would put up the money to buy books to fill the library and to staff the library. So he wanted a, a, a grassroots commitment uh, before he would go ahead. And Book Week was also meant to be that kind of um, connection to the community. Um, all across the country, um, librarians and teachers received information about projects they could do. Um, clergymen were encouraged to make sermons during that week about literacy, um, garden clubs, you know, every organization you could think of, the Elks Club, they were all supposed to get involved and um, talk about books, um, you know, bring books home for their children and generally set a tone where um, reading to uh, reading children's books and reading with children was part of um, the everyday life of, of that community. So the posters uh, were one of the ways to let everyone know that this was happening. And the poster on the left um, was the very first Book Week poster. It was used for more than one year, which is why it says 1920, not 1919 at the top. The artist they chose to make this poster was well chosen. Uh, it was a woman um, named Jessie Wilcox Smith. The reason she was a good um, choice was that she did all the covers for Good Housekeeping magazine. She'd been doing that year after year after year. And that meant that um, all the middle-class mothers, which was the core audience for a lot of this effort, um, who read that magazine religiously would recognize um, her artwork and they would see her as a trusted um, advisor uh, when she came along with a poster urging them to have books at home for their children. Um, poster on the right, which came along a few years later, was by N.C. Wyeth. And he, by then, was one of the most famous illustrators in the world in the um, decade before motion pictures. Illustrators at that time were great celebrities. I mean, they were creating the most powerful visual images before motion pictures came along. And they tended to be very, very well paid and treated like stars. Um, and of course, he was associated uh, with boys' classics, like the Robert Louis Stevenson um, stories, Treasure Island, and so on. And the point of his poster was to capture the attention of those 12-year-old boys who were about to leave school for uh, the last time in their lives to try to get them interested in, you know, quote, good literature so that they would continue to improve their minds after they were out in the world of work and hopefully, you know, finding a way to, to move on in life. Now, the middle poster, which I happen to think is the best book we poster ever made, <laughs> the most um, poster-like and elegant and in every way beautiful poster was by a mystery man. Um, I wrote a history of um, these posters, which was published as a book. And my, part of my job was to uh, be able to talk about all these artists. And um, this one was really tough. Um, it turned out um, that while posters were becoming very, very popular, both in America and in Europe at the turn of the century, as more and more people moved to cities. So there were there were lots of crowds where people uh, could would gather and became great focal points for a poster that had a message of one kind or another, whether it was political or a sales pitch or whatever. Um, in addition to posters, um, billboards were appearing all over America along the roads. And this man, um, Jay Brubaker, was one, probably the greatest billboard artist um, in America at that time. So it also turned out that he was the boyfriend of the secretary who was hired to do the uh, administrative work for Children's Book Week. So he had a kind of in, though he was also a great choice. And that's uh, how that poster came to be. 
Okay, so here I just want to, before I get to the posters that the library owns, just want to show you um, a taste of how these posters uh, reflect different times. Um, these posters from the um, 50s and early 60s, um, I think really correspond to what was happening in America after the war. People were moving to the suburbs. Um, like that butterfly chair is almost an emblem of um, suburban life. Um, and graphics were becoming a lot less heavy and ponderous and ideology driven than they had been during the depression years and the war years. Uh, white space was turning up in um, advertising and illustration on the walls of museums. Um, Bruno Minari, was a great um, Italian um, graphic artist uh, of the post-war years. And um, the fact that America had um, won the war uh, for the West um, and um, was more outward looking in terms of the rest of the world than it had ever been in its history uh, is reflected in the fact that um, the people who organized Book Week uh, thought it was appropriate to choose an Italian illustrator, somebody from Europe, uh, to um, to make the point that American children should um, should have access to children's books. And on the right here, this poster is by Paul Rand. Um, there's probably not a day in any of our lives when we don't see the work of Paul Rand uh, between sunup and sunset, because he designed the logo for UPS. He designed the logo for Westinghouse for IBM and any number of other um, global brands that are part of our everyday lives. He also taught at Yale uh, for many years. Um, and his poster also um, conveyed the sort of lightness of spirit, which was characteristic of the post-war years when people, people were shedding their ideologies and trying to um, um, just kind of relax and, um, find their way through the brave new world that they found themselves in. So now I'm, I am gonna talk about um, the posters that um, you have in your wonderful library. Um, and one of those posters was illustrated by this artist, Garth Williams. Um, and you will know him um, pro probably for more than one of the many books that he illustrated. The first um, children's book that he did illustrate in 1945 was Stuart Little. Now his parents were both British and he was born in New York, but when his parents divorced, he and his mother went to London. So he had um, a British art training. Um, and originally his plan was to become either a portrait artist or a sculptor. And there's a kind of a roundness and dimensionality to his drawings, which um, show the sculpture part and he was really a master at capturing character in a, in, a, in a face, even with just a few lines. So the portrait artist is there too. Um, he um, came to New York um, during the war uh, after having gotten wounded and um, tried his luck at the New Yorker where he met E.B. White and his wife, um, Catherine, who was one of the important editors there, which is how, you know, to make a long story short, he came to illustrate um, Stuart Little. Um, and he also met Margaret Weiss Brown, best known as the author of Goodnight Moon, but that hadn't quite happened yet. And they became fast friends. And he illustrated a number of books for her, including the one on the left here, which was bound in real rabbit's fur. You could tickle the belly of that little creature. Uh, and Mr. Dog, which was, um, one of the early golden books that he illustrated. And on the right there, he also re-illustrated all of the Little House books in 1953, which were considered the quintessential books of Americana at that time. Um, so he had a very important career, uh, was very much in demand. And here is his Book Week poster. To my mind, I still like the uh, J. Brew Baker poster more. But the interesting thing about this is if you look to the right, um, Anne Carol Moore, that librarian I mentioned a moment ago as being the most influential of all, 
wrote um, for the Herald Tribune, and she also wrote for a journal uh, for specialists called the Hornbook Magazine. And in the latter, her column, which you're looking at an example of, was called the Three Owls Notebook. And the three owls were the writer on the left, the illustrator on the right, and in the middle, the critic who was kind of keeping an eye on both of them. And Anne Carol Moore was not a wallflower. Um, she was very uh, sure about her opinions and um, kind of imperious about them. So I think what you see here in Garth Williams' poster is him having a little fun with her uh, because he was more in the nature of a maverick and a rebel um, and would have bristled at the, um, the unshakable authority of someone critic like Anne Carol Moore. So if she had three owls, he was going to have a lot more than three. Another um, um, illustration uh, phenomenon of those years was a married couple named Martin and Alice Provinson, who you see here. Um, they had both grown up in Chicago and lived oddly parallel lives for quite a few years before they finally met each other in Los Angeles, where both had gone in the late 1930s to work in the burgeoning new animation, animated film industry. And Martin worked for Walt Disney. Uh, he was in the character department, which was like the, the best part of the company you could rise to. And he worked on Pinocchio and Dumbo, two of the early um, uh, feature films that Disney produced in that glory period. Um, Alice was down the street at the Walter Lance studio, which was the creator of Woody Woodpecker. Um, then the war came along, and as a lot of um, animators and other artists did, they became involved in the war effort, making um, instructional films for the Navy. And that's that was the time when they actually met each other. Then they went east. Um, Disney was a tough boss, and he didn't like giving his artists individual credit very often. And um, the Provinsons, like quite a few other um, Disney artists, realized that uh, picture book making was an opportunity to have a lot more artistic control and to get credit for what you did. And they ended up uh, becoming core um, artists for uh, little golden books before they branched out and worked with other publishers too. Um, now, very often when you have a collaboration team, it's very clear who did what uh, between the two. But the Provinsons were just the opposite of, of that. They claimed that they would have their, uh, each would have something to do with, with um, every single image they created. Um, but they never uh, left, it, left their uh, signature or trail behind to, to make it uh, easy for people to figure that out. Um, but in any case, they were um, extremely talented and extremely versatile. Um, as you can see here, here are three of the dozens of golden books, uh, large and small, that they illustrated over the years, um, including um, a very charming um, story on the left uh, about um, color um, theory, um, cats mixing, kittens mi mixing primary colors to make secondary ones, but in a the framework of a very sort of silly, playful story, a retelling on the epic scale of the Iliad and the Odyssey. You're just you're seeing the French edition here, but it's published um, in the U.S. as well as in Europe. And on the right, um, their collection of Aesop's fables. But the list of what they did goes on and on. Uh, it's really, really extraordinary. And they were kind of scholars in the sense that whenever they did something that was uh, historical they would research the original sources and develop a style that made reference to the past while uh, sort of leaning into the future uh, in a way that children could appreciate, young readers. Um, and um, the librarians had um, certain likes and dislikes and they saw the golden books, which sold for just 25 cents a piece, the small ones did, um, as kind of like mass produced items like uh, Model T Fords. They didn't think of them as authentic works of art that were up to their standards. So Golden Books never won Caldecott medals and artists who were associated with Golden Books tended to be looked down upon 
by the library world. And their books certainly didn't make it onto too many library shelves for many, many years. But the Provinsons migrated to other more mainstream publishing houses in the later part of their career. Here you're seeing two books that, that they did for the one on the left for Harcourt Brace, the one on the right for Viking. And the Viking book, The Glorious Flight, uh, won them their Caldecott Medal. By then they would illustrated maybe 50 other books and I think, you know, could easily have won it on merit for any number of the others. But anyway, it was nice that they finally got their due recognition from the uh, the official officialdom of children's literature. And here, maybe with a reference um, to the story of the, the maze and the minotaur, the labyrinth, um, is um, their book week poster. Um, always um, clear and charming and um, with some kind of, there's always a kind of graphic distinction to what they did. Um, so like there's such a harmony to that image. Um, and this is Marsha Brown and she um, pulled a hat trick, uh, meaning that she won the Caldecott medal three times in her career, which is astounding when you think how many people there are making picture books. Uh, and only one person has managed to match that uh, record and that's someone who's still very much with us, David Wiesner. Um, Marsha Brown um, was a librarian so she kind of had an inside track since it's the librarians who give out those awards. And um, she worked at the New York Public Library for many years, um, organizing some of the musical programming and storytelling um, hours. Um, and she um, belonged to a period when librarians were deeply interested in world folklore and they saw stories that we sometimes call fairy tales or folk tales as um, as a kind of legacy of childhood. They like to talk about timeless tales and um, to say that you know no child should grow up without being exposed to these stories. So there was a big trend toward um, making picture books of uh, traditional stories from around the world and often illustrating them in a style that felt related to the part of the world that the story had originated in. And this was one of her, maybe the um, specialty that she became known for as a picture book artist, um, along with the more general um, uh, fact of uh, her versatility, her, um, her delight in reinventing herself uh, for every book that she did. Uh, there was nothing predictable about a Marsha Brown book. So these three books are the ones for which she won the Caldecott Medal over the years. And this is her Book Week poster, um, which again is, um, I mean, it's, you know, it's very well designed. Um, to our eyes, it probably looks a little bit drab. Um, the color palette was limited, I'm sure, for reasons of cost compared to what could be done today. Um, and yet um, it has a kind of modern feeling that transparent book um, is like the white space that we saw in Bruno Minari's um, uh, Italian poster from around the same time. Um, so they were looking to make posters that would uh, make children and the people who work with children see literacy as something of the moment that it was somehow connected to being a modern person in the new post-World post War um, society that they were living in. Um, and this artist, um, Lynn Ward, um, was the son of a minister uh, in Chicago. And he grew up with um, a, a strong um, idealistic streak and uh, determination to make art that would somehow change society for the better. Um, he was also uh, very experimental in his approach to bookmaking. And before he ever thought to make children's books, um, he produced a number of wordless um, graphic novels um, starting in, the, uh, in 1930. He was not the first artist ever to do that, but probably the first one was a Belgian artist from the 19 teens called Franz Masriel. Um, and Lind Ward was, in a sense, his um, greatest fan. Um, 
I don't know how popular these books were, but they certainly became influential. And in recent years, the Library of America um, issued a collection of Lindward's wordless novels with an with a, um, introduction by um, Art Spiegelman. Um, you could characterize his work as expressionist. You know, it's not trying to look like a photograph. It's trying to make you have a kind of spiritual awareness of, of the visible world. You're sort of seeing that world and then something beyond it at the same time. Um, and then later in his life, and this is true for a number of artists um, uh, with ideals, they come around later in their career to making children's books because it finally dawns on them that children represent the future. You know, so why not um, make books for that audience since they're the ones who are still young enough to change and are, you know, not set in their ways and are poised to um, to grow up and uh, enter into positions of authority. Um, so here are three of the children's books that Lynn Ward illustrated. The one on the left is certainly a well-known classic. It's the story of that little lighthouse at the foot of the George Washington Bridge that you can still go see in Washington Heights in um, Upper Manhattan. Um, and, you know, stepping back a little bit from the, um, from the literal story of that book, it's a reflection on um, mid 20th century industrial America, where everything was becoming gigantic and overwhelming, skyscrapers, um, ocean liners, and um, where would a child fit into a world like that? So there are a number of um, stories, picture book stories from that time. Little Toot about a tugboat is another one. Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel is another one where a small machine or structure uh, has to go sort of toe to toe with something much bigger than itself. Um, and in each of these stories, the little one is found to have a useful purpose to serve and a place in the world. So these were, I think, uh, deeply reassuring stories for children in what was really a brave new world of um, technological um, giganticism. Um, and um, Hildegard Hoyt Swift, the author, was married to the dean of the New School, which was very much a politically left of center progressive place. So there was a kind of, um, message intended by this book, uh, delivered in a gentle and witty way. Um, the middle book is quite unusual. It was published in 47, and it's a collection of stories about heroic African-Americans, both well-known people like George Washington Carver and unknown people just who did something that had been forgotten by history. Um, and to see a black face on the cover of a children's book in the 1940s was almost unprecedented. There were very, very few examples. And um, even down to our day, it's only just beginning to change in a big way in children's literature that the literature is recognizing the diversity of the American population. Um, so it's not surprising that Lynn Ward would have been attracted to um, project like that one as the illustrator. And again, you can see that it's the same author as the Lighthouse book, Hildegard Hoyt Swift. Then on the right, um, whoops, he um, kind of reverted to um, his earlier days, but uh, with children in mind this time, by creating a wordless picture book for young people. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of a dream fantasy, but it ends with a surprise that leaves the reader with the very pleasant suggestion that maybe life can uh, live up to our dreams um, in, in, in ways that are imaginable. Uh, and here is his <laughs> very um, emphatic um, um, Book Week poster. Uh, Gretchen and I were talking about this before the program started and Again, it's not the most warm and fuzzy image. Um, it is, I suppose, effective as a poster in that it kind of um, distills the image in a way that has enormous visual impact. You take it in at a glance, as you're supposed to do with the poster. Um, but it's kind of hard to relate to those three characters, especially the two, upper, the two older ones. Um, 
And it feel, to me, it feels like it belongs to an earlier era, which is the period of the 30s um, and on into the 40s when posters relating to the Depression and World War II um, were you know, delivering um, tough, urgent messages about how to survive and um, you know, keep a st stiff upper lip, things like that. Um, but it somehow it sort of, I think, misses the tone of what America had become in that increasingly prosperous um, baby boom era of the 1950s. The era of the hula hoop and the Walt Disney TV show. Um, another artist uh, who made a book week poster during the 50s is Leonard Weisgard. Uh, who um, grew up in New Haven and spent a fair amount of his adult life in, um, in Connecticut. Um, he was um, a, a wonderkind. Um, he enrolled in, um, he was first he was gonna be a dancer and he studied with Martha Graham. Then he had a, an accident and damaged one of his legs. So that was out. And he turned to visual art, um, enrolled in, um, uh, Cooper Union in New York, but dropped out after just a few weeks because he'd begun publishing his work in The New Yorker. Imagine that. He was too young to sign the contracts. His parents had to come with him. Um, and here we see him on the left making the image which you do, can see in full on the right, which was a greeting card for the benefit of UNICEF uh, during the 1950s. He was incredibly prolific. He illustrated about 180 books. Um, and very early on, here, here is some of his New Yorker work, um, one of his um, covers. So he was um, probably about 20 years old when he did that. Um, and th the pictures on the left and the right are what are called spot illustrations. The, the one with the horse on ice skates is absolutely one of my favorite drawings of any description. I just absolutely love that drawing. Uh, so you can see that he was funny. And if you look at the right side, that he had a great sense of design and, and even fashion. Um, and then he met Margaret Weiss Brown uh, only about a year into his career. And they uh, loved to experiment and, and bounce ideas off each other. And they created, um, along with about 36 other books, this very, very playful book uh, rooted in progressive education theory that young children are sensory learners and they love to make noise and to experiment and to participate in the reading of their books. They don't want to just sit there quietly the way librarians tended to encourage at story hour. This is a book about making the noises, imitating the noises of the city street um, as you turn the pages and try to guess what, and, and get into the head of this little dog with the bandaged eyes uh, and try to imagine what it would be like not to be able to see where you're going, to have to rely on your hearing in a busy place like New York. Um, on the left there is the cottage called The Only House uh, on Vinyl Haven, Maine, an island where Margaret Weiss Brown liked to hang out during the summer. And she would invite some of her illustrator friends up to work on books there together, including Leonard Weisgard. Um, her writing studio was in the window just under the roof um, that you can barely see in the photograph. And the view out the window is what you see in the photograph on the right. There was this little island which came to fascinate her and to become a sort of symbol of um, an individual um, holding its own in a big and complicated post-war world. And this led the two of them, she writing under the pseudonym Golden MacDonald, because she was so prolific, she couldn't just keep publishing books under her own name. Uh, together, they collaborated on this book, The Little Island, for which Leonard Weisgard um, won the Caldecott Medal. Um, and this, um, getting better, I would say, compared to some of the ones we've seen just uh, in recent um, times, uh, is his book week poster uh, with those really vibrant colors. And um, again, I would say a sense of the post-war world where children are not necessarily all cr crowded into a city, but are beginning to reconnect uh, with the natural world and 
and for books to play uh, a kind of connecting role um, in in that um, evolution. Um, now, Leonard Weisgard um, was about 15 years older than Marie Sendak. And the two of them met uh, when, uh, well, let me just tell you about this and then I'll explain that. Um, Sendak grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, his parents were not particularly well off. He had an older brother who was very talented artistically. Uh, he himself was the baby of the family and was um, chronically ill with one thing or another. So he very often found himself home in bed, looking out the window at the healthy children playing in the Brooklyn streets. And he took to sketching them in sketchbooks, which um, became a real passion for him and became the foundation for the work that the world later came to know him for. His brother, um, as I mentioned, was also artistic and uh, he regarded Maurice as his kind of protege. And they would do projects together and sometimes write plays to perform for the relatives. And they made these mechanical wooden toys, which they hand painted and tried to sell unsuccessfully to FAO Schwartz, where um, Maurice as a young man in his late teens got a job. Uh, he couldn't sell them his toys, but they hired him to help design their store windows. Um, well, FAO Schwartz at that time, we're talking about the late 40s, early 50s, had one of the best selections of children's books anywhere in the United States, uh, books for sale. Um, and there was a dedicated book buyer who was an expert on children's books. And she took an interest in this young man with a sketchbook uh, and decided to introduce him around uh, to the publishing uh, world, which was all based there in New York, uh, with the idea that it, it might help him get on in life. Uh, one of the people she introduced him to was Ursula Nordstrom, who was the great editor of her generation. Uh, she had published Goodnight Moon, she had published, she would publish Charlotte's Web, and she eventually published um, Harold and the Purple Crayon, um, Harriet the Spy, and Where the Wild Things Are, among many, many classics. Uh, and she saw his sketchbooks and pretty much hired him on the spot to start illustrating books for Harper. The other person he met at FAO Schwartz was Leonard Weisgard, the artist I've just been talking about. And Leonard saw in, and I have to say, I, I knew these people, so I feel okay uh, referring to them by their first names. Um, Leonard saw in Maurice um, a younger version of himself, and he decided to take him under his wing and helped him also get early illustration assignments and just generally gave him a lot of encouragement. And as a winner by then of the Caldecott Medal, he was in a position to, um, to help a young person like Murray Sendak in all sorts of ways. Um, this book, which you see on the right here, was illustrated by Leonard Weisgard, written by Margaret Weiss Brown, and displayed by Marie Sendak in the windows of FAO Schwartz. And it was actually on that occasion when that window was being installed that the two artists, Weisgard and Sendak, met each other. So it was a small world and it was a kind of um, very tightly knit uh, tradition. And had Margaret Weiss Brown not died unexpectedly of a blood clot at the age of 42, there's no doubt that she would have collaborated with Murray Sendak on picture books and just imagine what that might have been like. Um, so this was one of the very first books that uh, Murray Sendak illustrated and it was certainly his breakthrough book because what you can see uh, in this illustration in both illustrations right and left are his vision of childhood. Lots of illustrators have a style but only a very few have a vision and Sendak's vision was to be uh, true to what children are like as opposed to what we would wish they were like, uh, to show them not picture perfect, not like children out of a Kodak um, film ad, um, not particularly beautiful or well-proportioned, or more importantly, well-behaved. Um, and he wanted children to see reflections of their own behavior 
uh, particularly the behavior that a lot of adults scolded them for being bad, scolded them about for being bad, and for them to realize through these pictures that in fact what they were doing was perfectly natural. So Sendak was um, incredibly um, ambitious and energetic, and for a while he was illustrating six and seven, eight books a year, which was an awful lot. It's rare to do more than two, and one is not unusual for an illustrator. Um, and in the mid-50s, um, he created this, what is called a dummy, a kind of prototype for a book yet to be um, fully realized. And he called it Where the Wild Horses Are. And it's a wordless book. I suspect he was aware of Lynn Ward and his experimental books. And um, the trouble was he couldn't figure out what story he wanted to tell. He knew it was about a little boy who left home, went off on an adventure involving wild animals. Sounds exciting, but that only gets you so far. So he put this book uh, in a drawer and forgot about it, or at least didn't go back to it for another seven years. Meanwhile, illustrating probably two dozen more books and writing one or two of his own. Here is a very small sampling of some of the books from the early part of his career. Um, you can see that he worked uh, like Marsha Brown, but even more so in different styles uh, from book to book. And you can often identify um, the artist from the history of art that he was looking at at the time. Because Sendak never went to art school, he never went to college, and he um, immersed himself in the history of art, uh, not just illustration, but all of art, and uh, drank it all in and uh, simulated it and made it his own. Uh, and I'll just say that on the left, um, there's a real striking similarity to the watercolors of Winslow Homer. Um, okay. So here is his Book Week poster on the right. And on the left is a poster by another of the artists who interested him, Ben Sean. Um, and you can see from the caption up top that the, po the Ben Sean poster preceded his by about five years. If you, to me, the, I mean, the subject is obviously the same and the way it's presented is quite similar, but the real tell, the real giveaway that Sendak was fascinated by Ben Sean was the way um, the hands are drawn. Because Sean was really you know, like a political radical and was very much about the working person uh, and his dignity or her dignity. And um, the hands of Ben Sean characters always look like they've been uh, doing manual labor. They're almost swollen from it. And in Sendak's Clown, you see exactly the same thing. Um, so this is what came um, uh, seven years after that first dummy that was locked up in the drawer. A second dummy um, in the early um, months of the year um, 1963, which is the same year that Where the Wild Things Are was published. Uh, so the time between being in this sort of sketchy uh, mode and, and getting the book off the presses was really pretty short. Um, and there was a tremendous um, evolution that took place in Sendak's thinking, and he ultimately made um, what I think is perhaps the most perfectly balanced and realized picture book ever, and it certainly has had reverberations with artists all around the world as well as um, with children. So um, now we're up to the uh, or getting up to the present. And on the left is the Book Week poster from 1968. Um, there were some Book Week posters in the past that made reference to the war, uh, World War II, and um, to um, other things that were happening in society at the time. Um, 1968, of course, was a year famous for disruption of um, politics, assassinations, um, the Democratic Convention and chaos, rioting in the streets. And it spilled over even into Book Week uh, in the poster representation. And interestingly, um, Emily McCulley told me that she deliberately drew the child who was making the speech 
in an androgynous way. You can't really tell if that's a boy or a girl. Uh, and that was part of the statement she intended um, uh, to get away from traditional um, gender stereotypes along with everything else. Um, though, I mean, to have a protester wearing a pith helmet and another boy who looks like he is a student at Eton College uh, with the little shorts and the long socks and the tie um, shows that she was also tempering the message in a way that she thought would be palatable uh, to the American public. Um, the poster in the center and on the right are very recent posters, and they certainly reflect the fact that children's books has been publishing has been going through a major um, soul searching and reevaluation uh, an effort to bring all of American society, you know, into the story of um, children's books, both in terms of who is represented in the books and who the books are for and who's getting to publish the books and illustrate and write them. Um, Judy Morales is a Mexican born illustrator who sort of seems to move back and forth between uh, Mexico, where she, I think she currently lives and Los Angeles and other parts of the United States. Um, and she's remarkably, I mean, given how long we've been here as a country, uh, one of the very, very first uh, Latina um, illustrators to make a mark in the children's book world. And over on the right there, Brian Collier, who's one of the really great African-American illustrators currently in, I would say, mid-career, um, is the um, artist responsible for that um, poster from just um, a year or so ago. So um, this is uh, the book that I wrote. Um, and if you want to know more about these posters, it's probably the best place to to look. And you can see all hundred and all hundred of them. There have been a couple since, but the book had to go to press at some point. Um, and here's a an old photograph from the 20s, just to give you another glimpse of how the posters were used. Um, this is a glimpse inside the children's room at the Kansas City, um, Kansas Public Library. And you can see um, one of the posters that the very, what I had identified as the first of all the posters over on the left there. And the one on the right is another poster also designed by um, Jesse Wilcox Smith. And I think it's so amusing that they have these two children uh, flanking uh, the table with enormous books. I mean, it, the photographer must have had a sense of humor. They look almost too heavy to be held. Um, but I think it was meant in a um, maybe jolly way to communicate the idea that, um, you know, books are filled with uh, great things that are worth knowing. Um, so um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, the poster you're looking at here is by um, Tommy Unger, uh, one of the great illustrators who was working in America in the 60s and 70s before he moved back to Europe and uh, always kind of a provocateur and um, the very tart, uh, lively sense of humor. And his poster um, was no disappointment to anyone. So. Thank you for listening. And um, I would love to hear um, comments or any questions you might have. Does anybody have any questions? I'm wondering, Leonard, how the posters were distributed. Um, were they mailed to libraries unsolicited or could you request them? And did they go to anybody else um, like bookstores or? Ah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, the, originally, you know, Frederick Melcher, who I mentioned as being the man sort of in the background of a lot of the innovations um, for children's book um, publicity and recognition, um, organized a small office. He may have even lent um, the Book Week people his um, publishers, a, a portion of Publishers Weekly office at first. So there was secretarial help and uh, they put out brochures. They let um, librarians and schools and community organizations all across the country, uh, what was available to them. Um, uh, Gretchen and I were talking earlier about a kind of um, instructional guide um, that, that your library has a copy of, which is full of, um, you know, um, helpful hints about how to celebrate 
um, book week in your community. So there were materials like that. And there were also sales materials, you know, and you could order a certain number of posters for sure a nominal amount of money. Um, some years they also printed bookmarks. They printed up miniature versions of the posters that were the size of commemorative post posted stamps. So you could buy those and stick them on your letters if you wanted to. Um, the Boy Scouts, of course, were into craft projects and they came up with things like um, how to build a book a bookcase, you know, like a very simple wooden bookcase so that when you got the, the books that your parents were going to buy you for book week, you'd have some place to store them in your bedroom and you could have the sort of Boy Scout satisfaction of having built the thing yourself and maybe even get a merit badge out of it. Um, so, um, so there were... Um, I think they were just trying to maybe raise enough money to support some of these efforts. It was never a business. Um, and after um, World War II, um, as you know, the population in America probably doubled between the 1920s and the 1940s, and um, certainly the population of children was surging because of the baby boom, it's becoming a much bigger um, thing. And children's book publishing was becoming a much bigger thing. Um, when Robert McCloskey, you know, Make Way for Ducklings, won the Caldecott Medal in the early 1940s, he had to ask his editor when he got the news what what that medal was. Like he'd never heard of it, and you know, it was it was that small um, of an industry uh, at that point. But by the 50s, um, you know, school there was there was a lot of money to build school libraries all across the country, and the public library world was prospering and um, because of the baby boom, there was a lot of money to buy books in many communities and publishers were making their lists bigger and bigger. And um, so Book Week was kind of rising with that tide and uh, there was a need for a new way to organize it. So um, the publishers all got together and formed something called the Children's Book Council which still exists. And you know, they all paid dues and created this little office, which was meant to be a clearinghouse of information for everything to do with children's books. And if you were a young person out of college, you wanted to get a job at a, as a children's book editor, you would go to the Children's Book Council and they would tell you what jobs were available. Um, and they took it upon themselves to um, to sell the posters and eventually to choose the artists who made the posters and just to take over the whole thing. Um, yeah, so that's what I know about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Gretchen? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, first of all, you, you're making me really nostalgic for some of the early work I did in teaching third graders and every Friday we'd have a reading party and you know they yeah. bring these books for it I was just kind of there are days when I wish I wish I were back there again uh, more, more uncomplicated and wonderful time and I, I bring greetings to you from Linda Beach a friend of mine who worked at Scholastic for many years and and knew you she couldn't be with us tonight yeah. but she extends her greetings and my question to you is how uh how is it you found your way into this line of work? What, uh, what were the turning points that brought you and your career to this point? Huh. Well, um, it wasn't um, so much to do with being a child <laughs> as it was um, being a history major in college. Um, I mean, I was actually a remedial reader as a young child, and um, I struggled to learn how to read, even though I was I knew a lot of words and I was I could speak well, but I just couldn't get the um, the mystery of uh, I guess they call it decoding the word on the page at first. Um, so my reading teacher um, urged me to uh, write uh, little poems that I could read to her at our next session because I had written them myself. I had no trouble reading those. So reading and writing sort of came together for me as two sides of the same coin. Um, and eventually, um, I found, I, as, you know, everybody, or many people gravitate toward one kind of book or another. I found myself um, in love with nonfiction um, by third or fourth grade and particular biography. So I ended up uh, being a history major um, at Yale, and I needed to write a senior thesis paper and um, had taken courses that had to do with um, American history and um, began to think about how you start a new nation. 
um, especially one which is based on different principles than the nation that it was breaking away from. And I thought um, in a country where everyone is supposed to be equal, how, what impact, if any, would that have on families, you know, on the sort of power relationships between parents and children? Would parents be more deferential to their children, for example, less, you know, uh, like authoritarians? And I thought, um, well, how could you document that um, going back to the beginning of the 19th century? And I thought, well, if there were any children's books in those days, you would get a glimpse of how the adults were addressing children in print. And um, anyway, there were a lot of children's books and they weren't particularly interesting as literature, but they were like x-rays of the society's values and in, including their attitudes toward childhood and also toward fiction and storytelling and what the whether telling imaginary stories was a good thing, was nurturing the imagination or whether it was um, sort of siding with the devil and departing from you know the understanding of what reality is based on on the Bible. There was a whole spectrum of ideas about things like that. Um, so I, I realized that children's books were a great way to understand a society um, generation by generation. Um, and that one way or another, they always um, encapsulate the hopes and dreams of a generation. Um, and they do it more clearly than almost anything else because they're written for, for young people who, you know, who need to have it written clearly for them. Um, and then I paid a lot of attention, um, wandered into bookstores and was fascinated by the art in the contemporary books that I was seeing. And then I um, asked the, myself the question, why isn't that kind of art ever shown in art museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which I you know, love to visit. And that's when I realized that um, there was a pecking order in the art world. It wasn't all you know, wide open um, embrace of everything. Uh, some things were considered more artistic than others. And children's book art was at the bottom of the barrel. Um, and that in turn led me to think about how our society thinks about childhood. So all these questions were coming up just by from looking at children's books. And, um, and also, I mean, I could see that there were a lot of really astonishing illustrators and writers in our time. Um, so they were interesting as art, they were interesting as literature, as the history of literature, um, developmental psychology came into it, you know, when you try to understand um, how stories are being cast for audiences of different ages, um, social history. You could find almost everything in children's books. And so I thought it was, and I wanted from very young to be a writer of some kind. And it sort of occurred to me, this was a great subject to write about. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions or comments? No, oh, you'll get to see some of the posters soon. Um, four of the Children's Book Week posters will be at the Historical Society starting mm. on October 16th. So you'll have a chance to see them. We don't at the library have the 100 years of Children's Book posters, but we have the earlier version. Ah, that's right. Five years, but <laughs> can't get quite as far. We'll have to update our collection. Right. But, um, <laughs> We have this if anybody's interested in um, reading a little more about um, each of the each of the posters. Um, there's a something here on uh, in the chat now. Um, okay. Let's see. Michael asks. Most of the books shown seem to say illustrations by, but Sendak's book said pictures by Maurice Sendak. Is there a reason for the difference? That's interesting. That's a good question. Um, Sendak was. Um... I would say, well, he always had more than one opinion about something, and uh, he had a very compli complicated, reflective view of things. And um, one of the things he was conflicted about was um, um, what exactly he was doing <laughs> as an as an artist. I mean, there were times when he didn't when he thought illustration was a lesser thing uh, than art making. Uh, the world was telling him that. That goes back to what I said a moment ago about how museums weren't showing mm -hmm. um, children's book art uh, in galleries. Um, so I think he wanted to be, he wanted to align himself with the artists, not with the illustrators. Um, so I think that's really the answer to the question. Um, but they were, 
many interviews that he gave in which he seemed to take the opposite um, point of view uh, and sort of defiantly to embrace illustration uh, for what it was. And, you know, say, well, children are the best audience and, you know, I'm proud of what I do and to hell with everybody else. Um, so, um, but I, I do think that is the answer to, to your very perceptive question. Great, thank you. Any last chance for any questions or comments? Um, no? Well, thank you all very much for being here and thank you, Leonard, so much. Yeah. Really, really fascinating. I believe you mentioned that you were finishing up a book on the history of international children's um, mm -hmm. book. Illustrated books, yeah. It That's goes back right. to the beginning of the 19th century. It actually dips back a little bit before that in the introduction. Right. Well, it'll be session. out before um, next August 4th. Yes. Yeah, it'll but, be out on March 7th of next year. Right. So yeah. you'll be the first person that we invite to next oh. summer's book signing on August 4th. That would be 4th. so great. I would love that. Thank so, you. Yeah. We'll be back in the um, in the restored library, and we'd love to see you there. And uh, we'll see you again here um, in a few weeks on Thursday, October 20th. And mm -hmm. Leonard will be telling us all about our World War I posters, which should be fascinating. And then we'll have one more session um, with Darren Winston and David Pollock about the whole collection and sort of the significance of the posters for local history. Um, and that will be on Thursday, November 3rd. So I hope you'll all come back for those and you can find out more on our website. So thank you all so much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. See you again.